My paper is entitled Dr. Wolf Wolfensberger, a passionate and devoted truth seeker and a champion of the oppressed and the most vulnerable. This is a tribute to Wolf. Wolf Wolfensberger was born in Mannheim, Germany in 1934. Dr. Wolfensberger was an American academic who influenced disability policy and practice through his development of social role valorization, SRV. SRV extended the work of Bank Tenier in Europe on normalization. He later extended his approach in a radical anti-death-making direction and in the direction of personalism. In other words, he alerted us to the perils of making vulnerable people dead before their time, yes, while still living. He also alerted us to the severe limitations of services and systems in meeting people's needs. Wolfensberger always put greater faith in the personal efforts of citizens. Wolf was an idol, a guru, a leader, and an inspirational person. He worked tirelessly to liberate vulnerable people and improve their or our social position in society. He brought a vision and shared this wonderful vision with the world. Although Wolfensberger has left us, his work, his teachings, and his legacy will carry on. Wolf has touched people's lives, affected people's vision, and left permanent imprints in our hearts. Whilst the world grieves for Wolf Wolfensberger, I thank him from the bottom of my being. May we have the strength and resilience to share all of this with the entire world. Wolfensberger, through his teachings and writings, assisted me, and may I suggest many others like me, to view vulnerabilities through a completely different set of lenses. Having a disability didn't necessarily mean I was sick, mad, or morally bad, and nor were my ancestors. The problem was with society, and how it viewed people they perceived were not one of them, the other. This really gave me heart and thus a real sense to keep striving on with life generally. For this, I will always be eternally grateful to him. Since role theory was such a central premise of Wolf's work, please allow me to introduce myself through my roles. I'm an only child of a couple whose courtship spanned the war, with their marriage taking place in 1945. I was born in 1947. At this stage, Wolf was 12, and World War II had recently ended. Wolf had been separated from his parents during the war, and witnessed the results of gross, inhumane treatments during his trek back to his family home. By the time I graduated from kindergarten, Wolf and his family had migrated to the US. Thankfully for me and many others, the experiences of his early years would later affect me in my later years. But back to the 1950s for a moment, the Spastic Centre had established a school which was actually a state school, but of course, very unfortunately, only for spastic kids. This was how it was in those days, and people thought it was great. I'm not quite sure, but I can quite vividly remember one day thinking, I wonder if this is very much different from a convent school. I really wanted to go to a convent school, but ultimately it didn't seem to concern me all that much that I didn't and couldn't. I enjoyed school. I enjoyed learning about things. I also think that I saw school as a social occasion. Teachers and therapists would fight for my ownership, my clienthood. I had the three therapies daily physio, occupational and speech, as well as standing in standing frames. Teachers weren't too keen about all of these therapists wanting to interrupt their teaching programs. On the other hand, the therapists thought they had a role to play for their guinea pigs. At times I felt I was the meat in the sandwich, but again, that's just how it was in those days. I've had a disability from birth, and this has had an enormous impact on not only my personal life, but also on the lives of my parents and significant others. In fact, there are two parts to this impact. First, almost immediately I became a patient, a client. I wasn't considered normal and so had to be fixed. Who were these strange people in uniforms pulling and poking at my body, pulling my limbs every which way and other, taking copious notes of my movements or non-movements, etc.? They were the experts, the ones who knew all about the medication for my so-called high-level limitations. They never seemed to have high expectations, I often wonder if this was a collective tray of theirs or a reflection of their chosen profession. By the time I was 10, Wolf had begun his PhD in psychology. I didn't know it at the time, but he was steadily building his ideas that would so greatly affect my life and the lives of so many other people. I was both a client and a patient of an institution for a time in my life. This happened because I was worried about being a burden to my mother and wearing her out prematurely physically. Living in an institution, as well as being in other congregational and segregational settings, I have experienced what I term as being done unto. This is when other people exert control over me. 
even when it comes from a good intention, the impact is still the same. It takes by my own authority and my own sense of self. After living a segregated and congregated life for a time, I had to get myself out of these situations if I were to live the life that was authentically me. I now have a great little unit in the suburb of West End of Brisbane. I can walk to the shops, I can walk to church, and I can walk to an accessible railway station. I'm living in an area which tries to be more of a community than just a suburb. These were all part of the criteria I set with my group of friends before setting out to find my own place. These days, I hold the roles of a member of an inner city open and welcoming neighbourhood, a tenant in my own apartment, a jazz lover, a church member and Eucharistic minister, neighbour, member of numerous committees, jazz lover, local bookshop regular, a sports enthusiast and an activist. I'd now like to comment on nine contributions by Wolf that have made a significant difference to my life and the lives of many others. Contribution 1. Wolf brought values and vision together. Wolf greatly assisted in the liberation of vulnerable people to improve their, or our, social position in society. He brought a vision and shared this wonderful vision with the world. What was this vision? The vision is that we are all human. Yes, there are malaises such as oppression, vulnerability, etc., which is simply one person and groups of people committing the process of being done unto, to another person or groups of people. Contribution 2. Wolf identified that humans devalue other humans. This is important because it helped me to understand prejudice and oppression. When I heard Wolf talk, he was putting into words some of the things that I'd been feeling but hadn't heard anyone else articulate. Thus, until hearing Wolf and his teachings, I had dismissed these ideas in my own mind as odd occurrences that just happened to me, not necessarily as a systematic pattern towards people with a devalued status. I really feel indebted to Wolfensberger for enlightening my thinking and my outlook on life, especially how we interact with one another. I understand that it is part of the human condition to work out who we are by who we are not. I understand that this results in one-upmanship over the other. And I also know what it's like to be one-upped and the pain of this experience. I'm also aware that devaluation will always exist while our economies rely on having people with a devalued status around. Services are big business. At the heart of this, understanding that devaluation happens human to human means that we need to look at ourselves. It is not just them out there who enact devaluation, it is each of us. Yes, Wolf invites us all to be humble. Contribution 3 of Wolf's. Wolf named the negative experiences as wounds. This is important because it helped me to realise that this wasn't just something that developed in my own mind and that only I had experienced. The word wounds refers to our brokenness, and so doing wounding things speaks to the brokenness of the human condition. Contribution 4. SOV encourages us not to ignore people's vulnerability to further wounding. This is important because it is very easy to find oneself on a slippery slope. That is, if a person is vulnerable in a particular area, that vulnerability could be easily triggered or it could set off other vulnerabilities in other areas of the person's life. A blind faith in doing whatever the person chooses or doing whatever makes the person happy ignores the vulnerability of some devalued people to make decisions that might actually lead to harm in their lives. The vulnerability to poverty is largely ignored as is the vulnerability to rejection, scapegoating, ill health, and even loss of life. Wolf's work in this area has alerted us to the limits of simply adopting the mantra of rights and choice, which is so popular today. So this is an example of how Wolf deepened our thinking and encouraged us to not adopt simple solutions which are insufficient for complex problems. Contribution 5. Wolf identified valued roles as a key strategy in making a difference. If people haven't got a valued role, they are accorded or given a devalued role and therefore they are forced to act out that role. Other people will presume that they should be in that devalued role. It becomes quite circular. Valued roles put a different slant on the perception of the person by others and also in their own eyes. Valued roles help to level out the playing field. We were born equal, so therefore no one is superior to anyone else. If people don't have valued roles, then it is also much, much harder for them to have typical lives comparable to others in society. It's impossible to be part of community when the only role that one is in is client or patient. Even from the role of visitor to the community, 
is it impossible to belong in community life. It is only once I was truly a tenant in my own place, graduated from uni, undertook open paid employment roles for which my tertiary qualifications equipped me, also undertaking executive roles on disability not-for-profit organisations, it was only by attaining such roles that I could start crafting a decent life and a decent lifestyle. It was only when I had achieved in obtaining such roles that I was perceived more positively. Contribution 6. For those people who decide to draw on helpful values to work towards individual and societal change, SRV gives ideas about how to move forward. These values indicate a belief that people believe that we are all equal and so in trying to implement the principles of SRV, we are trying to make the playing field more level. Injustice is a negative part of the dominant paradigm that makes some people unequal or in a lower status to others. Contribution 7. Wolf reminded us about the importance of competency development and image enhancement. This is important because everybody should have the opportunity to fulfil their optimal potential and use all their gifts. We must always have high hopes for people. Kendrick uses the term being realistically optimistic. When there is no attention to competency development, there is time wasting. People stagnate. Often they will go backward. If you don't go forward, you go backward. The eighth contribution by Wolf. Wolf developed citizen advocacy. Citizen advocacy is important because it highly values the individual and it encourages the individual to live a life that is optimal for them. Citizen advocacy gives a voice to the powerless and oppressed. It also gives the devalued person citizenship. Everybody needs somebody in their life and having someone on your side is a demonstration of that. Bringing citizens in relationship with someone with a devalued status helps improve the perception of others and therefore self-perception. A citizen advocate is also a form of protection in light of the person's vulnerabilities and the wounding actions of the system. Contribution 9. One of the consequences of Wolf Wolfensberger's work was the community living movement. Moving out of the institution was for me moving to my rightful place beside my fellow citizens living in the community, not stuck away in an isolated, segregated and congregated facility. It meant I could live a lifestyle that was authentic to me, as I described before. Of course, this was not just about me. It is about all people. Young parents can hope for an ordinary and good life for their sons and daughters, but it also means we have a fight on our hands. There continues to be those who would lock us away. We have to join together to ensure that we are not further rejected or marginalised. Wolf was a remarkable man who was a leader in remarkable times. He realised that it was about time that some solid analysis be done in the area, and thank goodness that Wolf took up the mantle. I really admired his extremely sharp intellect and wit. In fact, I always felt safe in the knowledge that he was developing theories about vulnerable people. In concluding this brief tribute to Wolf, I would like to encourage all of us not only to take this body of knowledge to heart, but we must do all that we can to advance the movement. We must enable the theory to influence our thinking, as well as our daily practices and dealings with all of our fellow human travellers. Only then, certainly not before, will we be capable of addressing and hopefully alleviating our oppressive practices. Only then, and certainly not before, will we be capable of acknowledging the vulnerabilities of us all. They are an integral part of our human condition. Only when we acknowledge our vulnerabilities can we accept them. Only when we accept them, supporting each other in the process, can these vulnerabilities ultimately fall into utter insignificance. Many thanks to you, Wolf. Peace to us all. Mike Duggan